I'm going to turn our discussion back to S100. Uh, and we have um, an update on uh, fiscal note regarding our independent schools. So, um, AFO, can you help us do your work? Good afternoon, Julia, or good morning, Julia Richter, <laughs> Joy Fiscal Office. It's been a busy couple days, I think, for all of us. Um, I have been asked to provide an, um, an update regarding our estimates for independent schools. It's our understanding that currently this estimate should be covering the publicly tuition students at independent schools. So we estimate that in FY23, the cost of providing universal school meals to all public schools and to all public school students tuitioned at an independent school in Vermont would be approximately 29 million. So this includes the, the, the previous estimate that we had talked about earlier for FY23 of 28 million. But now we're thinking it will be 29 million when pulling in those publicly tuitioned kids. Yes, please, Representative. Uh, just a, a semantics. Uh, when you say publicly tuitioned students at independent schools, these are independent schools that also participate in the federal food program. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, yes. Okay. Representative Austin. Is that based on the current? participation or is that based on anticipated increase in participation? Yeah, so that estimate follows the same assumptions for FY20 fiscal year 23 that we um, used for our previous estimate. So that assumes the average participation of the 60% participation in breakfast, 75% participation in lunch, as well as an overall 30% um, of eligibility. So it's following the same assumptions that we've walked through. I'm happy to talk more about those if that's helpful. Um, but there's no, there's no real changes to the modeling other than there are more kids coming in, um, which is reflected in that increased cost. I will also add, I, know, I see that Rosie Kruger with AOE is here. I will add that there's, will probably be an additional administrative cost that's a maximum of $20,000. Um, I will let Rosie speak to that if you have questions. That's a number that we got from AOE. Um, so I'm happy to answer any other questions. Um, just, I just want to see if Rosie Kruger had, were you responding at this one or should we? Get Sure. Um, so just where that number comes from is that we would need to make a one-time change to our um, cl our claiming system that the schools use to submit their claims to allow for a separate line for independent schools to submit um, publicly tuition students that are in the paid status compared to uh, publicly tuition students that are in uh, non-publicly tuition students in the paid status, since there is still some federal reimbursement for, um, for those other paid students. Um, so it's a fairly simple change. Um, it, I've talked to our vendor a little bit about it. They haven't been able to do a, a full estimate, but it, it's definitely going to be under $20,000. That was sort of the, the, the kind of maximum amount they thought it could be, but it's a, a fairly simple change. Um, and then I guess if you were to not extend um, this further than one year, uh, we would need to make that change back at the end. Um, so again, I think 20,000 is a very generous estimate for the cost of, of this work. Um, and we can work to get that refined um, in the next few days if, if you are definitely gonna go that direction. Um, and I guess I will ask for the, the additional cost to reverse that um, as well when I'm asking them for estimates. Thank you. Representative James. Um, just to confirm, you said that um, the model assumes a 30% eligibility. That's for free and reduced, right? Correct. Okay. My, my only other question was, I I thought we heard yesterday that we thought the independents were, were going to add 2.6 million, but now they're only adding 1 million. So I 
I did a back of the envelope calculation based on the number of students who were enrolled at independent schools participating in the National School Lunch Program. That number is actually higher than the number of publicly tuitioned students oh, I see. Um, in, okay. in Vermont in general at schools that are, are not necessarily participating in the program. So that's okay. why it came down. So the so back after, of the envelope was on total enrollment, not the public publicly tuitioned students. Right. And I hadn't realized there was such a difference there. But OK, thank okay. you. And if I may also add to that, um, we do anticipate that these costs will increase over time, as we've spoken about previously. So this 29 million estimate is for FY23 with an increase of costs over time. So another difference is that um, with increased participation, of course, these costs will increase as well. Thank you. I'm representative Austin. Just real quickly, just on the ground, does that mean that publicly um, tuition Vermont students will be with non-publicly uh, funded students and there'll be a separation of, like in the cafeteria, who gets uh, universal free lunch and who doesn't? So my assumption about how that would work is that the schools, these, these independent schools charge tuition and that they would add some kind of tuition line or some, some increased cost in their tuition to cover the cost of those um, non-Vermont students um, so that they wouldn't need to differentiate. Um, I think that would, that would kind of be the only way of, of reasonably handling it. Um, so, uh, you might ask some independent schools to share their perspective on how that would work, but that would, I guess, be my recommendation. Thank you. Anything else? <clears throat> this would change the fiscal note that we've been working for, with from 28 million to 29 million. Correct. If the committee decides to go in this direction. Okay. The committee comfortable with putting in the 29? You feel like we can explain that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm seeing not include the 29. Okay. Okay, committee discussion. We had a couple. Um, I think, Senator Brown, did you have some thoughts you wanted to share? I wasn't sure. It was before us. Oh, I was just I was doing sort of a, a little roundup in my head of the of the possible pieces that we still had to had to fit in and the, the 29 million that we just heard about from Julia was sort of one of those boxes. Right. So we will um, we will communicate that to the best is not here. Okay. Okay. So, so you got that communication then to yes. It's a, um, I do see we do have um, the NEA in the room and we would if you are able to respond to this bill I think we've sent the bill the, yes. I have reached out to our other um, education associations to respond I would we would love that thank you <laughs> all have been missing in this conversation so uh, for the record, Con Robinson, Vermont NEA. Good to see folks. Uh, I know, an IRL, right? <laughs> um, um, as you heard from President Don Tinney, we're very supportive of universal school meals, and um, we had an opportunity to briefly review the most recent draft and uh, are comfortable with this approach of segregating the 29 million dollars, I believe, right? That's the updated figure um, in the education fund surplus. I believe that's a, an appropriate use while you further investigate um, how to um, move this program forward so kids can have full belly so they can actually access their learning in school. And what do you think the impact will be on teachers when this is handled again for next year? As, as we allow another year for university. Oh, well, I think as this committee's probably heard many times over uh, a hungry kid can't access their learning the same way a kid who can't get to school on a school bus can access their learning and um, by making sure that kids have full bellies they're going to be able to have growing minds and those growing minds can absorb the instruction and also of course it you know i mean one of the impacts of the pandemic but to be frank it predated the pandemic our students are coming to school with greater and greater social emotional needs and when 
um, some basic needs are supported to grow healthy and strong bodies. That helps to maintain regulation so they're actually able to um, be healthy uh, students and engage with their peers and their teachers and other educators in school. I think we had certainly hoped to find a long-term path, um, but we have not been able to find a pathway forward to a long-term path. Yep. So given that um, we are hoping that we're moving to endem endemic from um, right. pandemic, that having that stability available to the schools next year um, struck us as a priority. Absolutely. So we would prefer in many ways to have another resource. I'm speaking for a lot of the committee members, that is, as I say, we, I'm not speaking for yes. everybody. Um, to have a long-term plan, it's, it's an option at this point. So during this transition time, if we can just keep that as a form of stability, I think this committee has heard loud and clear um, that you don't want new initiatives. This is not necessarily a new initiative, but it's definitely a way of spending money that, that was not anticipated. Um, but we have looked at the need to provide some sense of stability to a stressed system. I hope that this is one way yeah. that we can address that. And we know that you know schools have been doing this for, for two years now, um, and it's had positive impacts and uh, definitely maintaining, we, we can't think of many better uses for this unique moment that we have with the surplus in the education fund. What's the impact um, if we take it away? Well, I'm sure there are others in the room and you've heard from others who can speak more eloquently with greater expertise on that than I, but um, I think as just common sense dictates that you're going to have kids who are going to struggle to access the food that they need to be able to be successful learners. We're continuing to work with our federal delegation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, Representative Austin. So um, what I'm hearing from some of my constituents is, you know, they're going you know, the children that need to be fed as determined by the federal government are being fed. And they are wondering why we're asking hard working from lunches to pay for middle and upper income families lunches. Yeah, I mean, you know, basic premise of public education is that Vermonters come together to provide uh, equitable education to all learners. and. You know, we don't ask families of different socioeconomic statuses to pay for their children's textbooks. We don't ask children of different socioeconomic statuses to pay a bus fare when they get on the bus. As we've seen over the past several decades, schools oftentimes are the only, maybe the only, um, one of the few safe, stable places in the child's life and creating opportunities for them to receive the supports they needed to be successful learners has expanded. And the pandemic has only shown that in greater ways. And so as schools have shouldered that responsibility, um, we have not, I don't think, as a mission of public education, delineated lines between those families that might have means and those that might not. So I would say that providing high quality food to students so they can learn at this point is um, a core function of providing and ensuring our education system is able to do what it needs to do to support those learners in the same way making sure that they have uh, high quality curriculum and textbooks is. There's no stigma getting on the bus because we can all get on the bus. Yep. There's no stigma that's considered about who gets the textbook and how they're getting it. But there still remains stigma about food and access to food. So we're trying to bring that into the conversation for those that are struggling. Okay. Committee discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that we have some missing voices in the room. I have reached out to our other uh, education associations, um, trying to see if we can get them in, uh, at least to respond um, by one. And uh, I know that there are definitely, there's definitely always that concern that we could use that money for something else. And we know that there are other um, pressures, certainly related to our facilities and things like that. <coughs> Just trying to figure out how we might, might be able to do it all, or at least to do 
this the best we can. I appreciate your contribution. Yeah, good to see you all. Okay. Thanks for, <laughs> Thanks for doing this work. Okay. Thank you. So we'll have an opportunity to hear from from our education associations where um, we vote. I think that we owe that to the field that we, we listen to. Um, and I don't know if we'll be able to get that done by one o'clock today or not, but I'm going to do a quick call with them a little bit later and see if we can get them to come in or to at least give us a written response. So that's where we are. We had a couple of um, things before us, uh, whether the committee wanted to consider some of those things. We had one question about uh, putting in language uh, that Representative Cooperly mentioned about um, requiring some that, that the General Assembly contacts the, you know, stays in touch with the, our federal delegation. There's some uh, note that we already have maximizing federal requirements. Um, why don't you look at that Representative Cooperly and see if there's something in there. Yes. We've got one final version of the. Oh, sorry. No, sir. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Go ahead, Reverend. We have one final version coming to us this afternoon. But... If, uh, we need to address. We need to address the number. Yes. We need to address who gets the report back, and those are in process. Um, that those changes have been made. Those changes. Flood you with. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's that's great. That's great. Um, so those are in the current draft, and that draft is posted right now. No, I have made those changes. You have made them, okay. But um, I didn't know if the committee was gonna make further changes during yeah. this discussion, and yeah. rather than send you draft six, and then seven, and then eight, That's right. I'm gonna send you one draft. That, we would love that as well. I also see we have the Agency of Education here. Um, Ted Fisher, are you prepared to respond to the current draft of S100? For the record, Ted Fisher. Join us, join us. Um, if you don't mind, Madam Chair, I'd like to defer to my colleague, who is our expert, who is okay. using Zoom. Okay. Group, but I'm always happy to be But in terms of the support for moving forward in this direction, um, we've got the we we have the expertise in the room. Now we need to to see if this is something that we have worked to try to respond to the concerns that the administration has had in terms of how this is funded and we're trying to hold with the the desire to at least keep this program going for one more year as we figure out what it truly will cost Understood. so we're looking i know I that the, the end of the day yesterday mm -hmm. but i can try to run upstairs during lunch break and check to see um, and also check on our bosses on the road, but we'll be doing this afternoon as well. Great. Thank so you. Yes, yeah. right now, but we will try to get that. I understand you're working to get the done as soon as possible. Yes. Of course, I don't have anything more since yesterday. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, Representative Williams. Yes, will you give me clarification as to the route this bill takes after it leaves this committee? Yes. Here's today's weather, weather report. <laughs> <laughs> the current plan, um, because this has, addresses the Ed Fund, it's required by rule to go to the Ways and Means Committee. So they will be taking this bill up and reviewing it. If we can pass this out of committee, it will go straight there automatically. Um, from there, it's possible, yes, it would go to the Appropriations Committee as well, I believe. There's the language we have in about the positions that's traveling. It's, it's a little bit uh, sort of currently on the wall in Senate appropriations related to the positions. So I, I have to sort that out. How This would likely, if the, if the Ways and Means Committee uh, approved you know, and wanted to approve or amend this, it would likely come after the waiting study bill, the waiting bill. That would be that would be my guess in terms of timing, because there are pieces of this that are related to the work there. Mm -hmm. Then it would go to the floor. And if we can pass it, you know, they, someone could decide that we need to um, pass a flag still on it, which not be appropriate. <laughs> um, 
Please don't put that in the press. <laughs> um, so then it would go, go to the Senate and they would look at it and then decide. You know, Still got a pretty long road then, huh? This is the legislature. We work slowly. <laughs> if you want things done quickly, this is not the place to come. <laughs> We're a very deliberative body and sometimes things take a long time. Thank you. Ways and means, um, we would have an opportunity to, we would respond to it, we would respond to any um, amendments that the Ways and Means Committee would do. We'd have an opportunity and would we would need to report a response to any amendments that the Ways and Means Committee made. We would report whether we're, we're in favor or not. So for it to become law, the last leg before the governor mm -hmm. is the Senate. It depends. Uh, so, so we pass it. We pass a bill. It goes to the Senate. They have an opportunity to review it. They could amend it. And then we if they it. amend it, it comes back. They can accept it. They can, they can just sign off and say we concur. Then it goes to the governor. All right. Got it. Thank they you. can offer an amendment, then it comes back to the House. Then we can offer an amendment back, <laughs> or we can say a committee of conference where we iron out our differences. Okay. Thank you. So any comments before we, we break? Come back, coming back at one. <coughs> Uh, uh, to um, Representative Kupali's um, desire to sort of urge our congressional delegation to um, really pursue this vigorously. Uh, um, we have issues with sort of putting it in a bill that binds a future legislature to do that. Um, but I, would, I would fully be on board with a resolution that would call for that and would be happy to assist in its creation and support. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that's a good idea. It might even have more, I don't know if that would have more punch or impact even than putting it in the findings or something. Okay, well. <laughs> We, we did get a response from the post office on our postal. We resolution. did get a response from the post office. <laughs> so. I think that was a little jolt. Yeah. Them. Yeah. So they pay attention. Ted had his hand up. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Ted Fisher. Uh, for the record, again, Ted Fisher from the Vermont Agency of Education. My crystal ball does not have an update, sadly, but I did just want to express the agency's um, appreciation for your work, particularly to uh, make sure that this is adequately resourced and implementable. Really, really appreciate that. Um, we are able to do this work and, um, and being able to execute it faithfully is, is, is great. We appreciate your attention. Thank you. Yes, with the, with the um, appropriations for positions, that does go to the appropriations committee. Okay, we'll be back at one o'clock. Um, we will not have our uh, ledge council in the room, so if there are any other amendments, um, we need to know about that now, uh, or before one o'clock. Um, and I'll see if we have the opportunity, if we'll be ready to vote for it. <laughs> <laughs>